Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our uh, September 30th South Talk, the last of the month. Um, it's such an honor to introduce our panelists today. My name is Katerina Pasadomo, and I am uh, the, an Associate Professor of Southern Studies and Anthropology here at the University of Mississippi. Uh, it's a real honor to introduce two of my friends and colleagues whose, whose work I admire a lot. Um, so today we'll be hearing uh, a conversation between Dr. Simone Delerme and Anne-Marie Anderson, who are both uh, people who do oral history work here at the University of Mississippi. Um, and this is a conversation that is following a recorded talk by Dr. Delerme, which is available on the Southern Studies website. Um, I'm sure Afton will provide the link to that in the chat box so that you can watch it if you haven't already. Um, and the, the topic of that talk was from Latino Orlando to International Memphis, Migration and Transformation in the U.S. South. So Dr. Simone de Lerme is the McMullen Associate Professor of Southern Studies and Anthropology at the University of Mississippi. Dr. de Lerme specializes in Latino migration to the U.S. South with interest in race relations, language ideologies, social class inequalities, and suburbanization. She holds a bachelor's degree in political science and a master of arts in liberal arts from the University of Delaware, as well as master's and doctorate degrees in anthropology from Rutgers University. The research featured in her new book, Latino Orlando, Suburban Transformation and Racial Conflict, focuses on Latino migration to Orlando, Florida, and the social class distinctions and racialization processes that create divergent experiences in Southern spaces and places. Dr. Delerme is working on a new ethnographic research project, which you'll hear more about today. And that project examines Latino migration to Memphis, Tennessee, and North Mississippi. In addition to her book, Dr. Delerme's work has been featured in several academic publications including Southern Spaces, Southern Cultures, Central Journal, and Anthropology News. In conversation with Dr. Delerme today will be Anne-Marie Anderson, who is the lead oral historian for the Southern Foodways Alliance. In 2017, Anne-Marie was the first person to graduate with a master's degree in oral history from the University of Florida. Anne-Marie also earned bachelor's degrees in English and history from, from the University of Florida. Since joining the Southern Foodways Alliance in 2018, Anne-Marie has conducted dozens of oral history interviews and you can uh, peruse that, that broad collection at southernfoodways.org. So please join me in welcoming our panelists today, Dr. Simone Delerme and Anne-Marie Anderson. Thank you. Thanks, Katerina. I'm so happy to be here with you today, Simone. Happy to be here. Well, I, I really enjoyed listening to your talk, and if you all who are attending, uh, who are attending today have not watched the talk, Afton's put that link in the chat, and I really um, hope that you'll be able to watch that a little bit later, because it's really interesting. Um, but I thought, Simone, that we could get started and maybe get a little more, bit more context for um, your Latino Memphis and Oxford project. Um, tell us a little bit, give us a little bit more context for that project and tell us, um, introduce us to some of those restaurants and um, some of your narrators. Yeah, well, more broadly, I'm interested in communities that are undergoing transformation, uh, usually demographic transformations because Latino migrants have come in. Uh, and I've expanded that to be interested not only in Latinos, but other migrants as well and refugees. So that's what I've kind of focused on first in Orlando, and now I've really expanded to Memphis and focused on Memphis. Uh, but it goes back to 2016, actually. I paired up um, with students that are now in our grad program, uh, Catherine Averly and Brittany Brown. Uh, and we went back in 2016 and we tried to document what we called uh, Invisible Oxford. So as students, they were undergrads at the time, uh, Catherine, for instance, and some of her classmates were able to identify people that were in the community, but somewhat invisible, uh, but part of the restaurant industry or other uh, industries connected to foodways. 
So I remember one of the first people we interviewed was Bobby. Um, and he, he was the owner of a restaurant called Locals. And it was slightly off the square. Uh, but he was from India. And so was his father. And his father worked at the university. And they were really important in fostering kind of a community amongst Indian uh, international students. So we recorded his oral history. Uh, I remember Roland. He was from Switzerland. And he is a brilliant chef. Uh, brilliant culinary background, had his own restaurant in Memphis, has cooked for royalty, politicians, uh, and he was hidden away in a fraternity house, uh, cooking for them and planning out their, their meal plan and program and whatnot. So we interviewed him. Again, uh, I'm interested in not only communities transforming, but people, people's experiences when they come as migrants, say to a small town like Oxford. So that's where we got started. And then I paired up with the Southern Foodways Alliance, to try and document oral history specifically um, with Latinos uh, in Oxford. And then we expanded to Memphis. And that's where Brittany really came in and helped me with the, the project in Memphis. Uh, but with that, we were really focusing on restaurant owners, managers, workers, uh, trying to see what their challenges were in terms of owning a business, operating a business in the South. Uh, challenges in terms of being incorporated into the community. Uh, and we met really fascinating people in Oxford, um, the Munoz family, for instance, responsible for Casa Mexicana, uh, and a number of other restaurants uh, that are even going by different names. But again, they've expanded tremendously in the region. So again, just trying to understand their stories, their successes, upward mobility was possible uh, for a lot of these people, these narrators, uh, through entrepreneurship. And then I learned about the concentration on Summer Avenue through those oral histories where it became clear that there were Latinos in a particular part of town. They had a lot of businesses. Uh, it was a thriving community. They had really contributed to the revitalization of the area. So I tried to document those stories as well. And that's the project I'm working on now in Memphis. Uh, and I was renewed in, in the project in 2019. Uh, because they were trying to brand that particular area as a commercial district, uh, an, an international commercial district, I should say. So that's kind of what I was doing. Florida was the Puerto Rican population I was documenting here. It's a little bit more international. I'm muted. <laughs> Sorry. That's great. Tell us a little bit about um, Specifically, you mentioned the Muniz fam family here in Oxford and some of those other men who um, have a more international background who are cooking in, in Oxford and are, are a little bit more invisible. But could you talk a little bit about some of those specific restaurants and some of those restaurateurs or managers that you, you and Catherine and Brittany came to have a relationship with? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, I, I can go to Summer Avenue. And initially, my intent was to focus first on non-Mexican restaurants. So because the majority of Latinos are Mexican, I wanted to see what those experiences were like for those that had Venezuelan food, uh, Colombian food, Cuban food. So those are the folks we started off with. Uh, and I learned very quickly they were families. Uh, they were family operated. Uh, it was, you know, the aunt and uncle in the kitchen. Sometimes the kids were, were serving. Uh, sometimes there were roots in the construction industry, and this was an opportunity for upward mobility through entrepreneurship. Uh, sometimes it was the wife in the kitchen, and she had a passion and love uh, for cooking and always did. And, and this was an opportunity to introduce something new to Memphis. So these people are really important. I saw them as cultural brokers where they were introducing you know, other Memphians to uh, diverse Latin American cuisine, not just Mexican cuisine, because that has a longer history here. Uh, and also really being important to the Latino community itself in that you know, they were enabling people to preserve their culture by eating the foods that were familiar uh, in a space that maybe wasn't so familiar. So those are just some of the people. Um, I'm thinking of restaurants in particular, like Mi Tierra, and they have, uh, it's a woman, it's owned by two women, actually. One is uh, from Guatemala, the other is from Colombia. Uh, they started off serving Colombian food and then realized that they weren't quite competitive enough because people weren't familiar. So they introduced Mexican food as well, and they do both. So they have two menus. So it's, again, a nice opportunity to maybe sample something that's not familiar to you while still being able to choose and have access to familiar Mexican food and cuisine. So again, there's, there's been women, there's been families that are working together, uh, different parts of Latin America definitely represented. That's great. Well, 
maybe we can talk a little bit about, um, I'm interested in you, you're an anthropologist and you're using oral history um, as a tool to, to okay. study people um, and, and to have a relationship with them. Um, I'm wondering how the practice of oral history specifically um, has impacted, you know, the field work that you've done now, um, both eth ethnographically and kind of getting into the community in, on Summer Avenue specifically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It really was just the introduction. Um, it was the very beginning. It was my first introduction to the community and some of the people. Uh, it helped me identify some of the major players because in introducing my project, I got to learn other names, other people I needed to speak with. Um, but I'll be honest, as a cultural anthropologist, I spend a lot more time and I get the richest data through my informal interviews and through participant observation. So my project in Memphis is really a mixed methods project where it started off with oral history. But now, for instance, um, just yesterday, actually, uh, yesterday I was just talking with um, individuals I had filmed and recorded a podcast with, and that was the director of Latino Memphis, uh, his wife, who's an activist and artist, and uh, a commercial appeal journalist who wrote uh, really the first and only book that exists thus far about Latinos specifically uh, in Memphis. And so, you know, it was a very informal conversation, but some of that information was so rich. And I found, even with my oral history interviews, as soon as I stop the interview and the recorder goes off, that's when they start talking to me about the real. That's when I found out who was, for instance, undocumented, you know, and struggling to try and maintain a business using somebody else's information. And again, you know, it's information that cannot be in an oral history interview recorded and transcribed and made public. So I learn a lot about people informally, about their experiences, uh, where they feel like they can be anonymous. Because when I write my ethnographies, I change people's names oftentimes to protect them, protect their identities. So I learn more about race relations, about their challenges, about their struggles, uh, how they're trying to navigate the black-white binary when, again, I, I stop the record button. So oral histories are an intro for me as an anthropologist. They give me some background knowledge but then I like to do other types of things as part of the process of data collection. That's so interesting. I find that I have that same struggle sometimes as people really wanna to talk to you, but when you turn on the recorder, sometimes that can be hard. Um, I'm wondering how you're talking about all of this informal information um, and all of the um, really rich data that you get from cultivating those relationships. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how, how do you use that informal information? How does that inform your work as a cultural anthropologist? Well, field notes are everything. I'm teaching an ethnographic methods class right now. And so when I'm in the field on a daily basis, I need to be writing and crafting that narrative. So I take daily field notes and those end up uh, being coded later for themes, key questions, key insight. And then that's how I start to write uh, a chapter, for instance. So um, I'm trying to think of an example with my book on Latino Orlando. Um, I lived in people's homes as part of the encargado system. So it was very informal. I was literally renting rooms. There were people that were documented, undocumented, sleeping on couches. Some had access to a private room uh, like I did and they paid a rent. Uh, to somebody who kind of oversaw the spaces. But again, you had a lot of individuals working together, maybe at a hotel, as was the case in the homes I was living in. And again, on a day-to-day -day basis, I was learning a lot of information, uh, for instance, about how they perceived other people uh, that were identified as Latino. So how did Mexicans perceive Puerto Ricans? Uh, how did Guatemalans talk about them? It was all very informal conversation that wouldn't come out if I had recorded them. And when I did record them, and ask them questions, you know, about conflicts within. You know, that, that didn't come out, but on a day-to-day -day basis, just living there and then captured in my field notes, I would hear that side comment that, that, you know, tuned me into something else that was going on deeper. Maybe even subconsciously for them, you know, they weren't aware of it, but that comment let me know what questions to dig deeper into. That's great, thank you so much. I think that that's a really good segue into a question asked by Anisia. Um, one of our attendees, she says, um, I watched your pre-recorded South talk and was wondering how did you perceive the dynamics among Latinx in the South whose ancestors migrated 
or who they themselves migrated from different Latin countries or regions, for instance, Cubans, Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, et cetera. I mean, the one thing I definitely learned was that the Latino experience is place specific. So what I see in Memphis differs from what I saw in Orlando, for instance, and also that those communities are not in any way homogenous, even though, for instance, the book title says Latino Orlando as if it's some kind of unified homogenous community. It's not. So, for instance, I saw I have a whole chapter dedicated to social class inequalities and differences uh, where I did a lot of participant observation and field work in uh, these business networking organizations or chambers of commerce where you had more of the professional elite uh, and they were distancing themselves. I mean, they had cultural capital uh, that, you know, working class folks perhaps didn't have uh, and, you know, different access to, to resources that built social capital and therefore economic capital. So I saw a lot of social class differences. And in studying, for instance, those chambers of commerce, I learned about some of the inter-ethnic conflicts that had existed in the history uh, of some of those chambers. So for instance, historically Cubans were the majority in that part of Orlando, uh, but then Puerto Ricans slowly took over and became the majority. So there was conflict over the chambers of commerce. You know, would it be a Hispanic chamber of commerce? Was there a Puerto Rican one? And there ended up being two. Uh, the Hispanic chamber of commerce was run at the time I was doing field work by a Venezuelan immigrant, uh, for instance. So you had some diversity within, but also conflict and tension in the history uh, in terms of who was being represented uh, or if perhaps a group needed their own specific space and place uh, to advocate maybe for uh, trade between specifically Puerto Rico. Uh, other tensions I saw or inter-ethnic, uh, maybe challenges or differences uh, amongst the Puerto Rican population. Uh, one of the things with my own personal identity I was made very aware of was the difference between New Yorkans and Puerto Ricans, uh, people who were, say, from the diaspora, from New York City, uh, and those who were from the island. There were distinctions. And there, always, there wasn't always a unified uh, front in terms of advocating for the larger Latino population. So I'd say there's hierarchy that exists. Um, in my informal research in the Encargado system, I certainly heard a lot of uh, very negative perceptions of Puerto Ricans, uh, but seeing them as privileged for having US citizenship and not taking advantage of that. So culture of poverty arguments, um, things about questioning the deservingness of the Puerto Rican population. So those are some of the things uh, that showed me it's not a homogenous population and there's a hierarchy that exists with maybe Spaniards and Cubans higher up, uh, Puerto Ricans and Mexicans lower down. Thank you so much. Brian Foster has given us another question to ask and I'll read it to you, Simone. Um, he says, I've been thinking lately about how to know when the quote ethnographic story quote ends. How we the eth ethnographers or writers may be on a clock for example, book deadlines that may not align with the story we're telling. The question, I'm wondering if there are parts of the story that you tell in Latino Orlando that have continued to develop, findings that you now have more context for or new findings that are now clear to you. Yeah, and you know what, for me, I'm really grateful for the researchers that have come after me because they've picked up where I've left off. So I'm saying that where there's uh, doctoral students that are doing dissertations in Orlando. And my research is just, I, I feel like it's just, mine and um, a colleague, coworker, Patricia uh, Silver, she was a mentor throughout the process. Uh, and we've worked together on a number of projects, but she also at the same time was doing ethnographic field work in the very same place I was at the very same time, which is rare for cultural anthropologists. So we would talk about these kinds of things. And you know what we realized, and I'm clear about it in my book, you know, my field work stops at a certain period of time. And so things happened in Orlando, like, you know, the horrific events at Pulse nightclub. Uh, there was awful, catastrophic, uh, you know, destruction to the island of Puerto Rico that sent an entire exodus, uh, you know, Puerto Ricans coming in major, major waves to Orlando. And this is all happening after I finished my field work. So I wish I could have written that in. Um, and I just kind of had to leave it alone and realize, you know, I had to stop at one point because I could continue uh, now with what's happened after. Uh, you know, a hurricane and all of these people have come in without resources and without the preparation to have a job before they arrive or housing. So the story has only become more complex 
in terms of the ethnography of what I've done. And I really just had to stop when the field work stopped uh, in terms of what story I could tell. And once I exited the field, because I think so much has transformed that I, you know, when I did go back, I mean, restaurants that I had studied weren't even there anymore. Uh, one of the professional organizations that I focused on no longer in existence. So again, all this transformation has happened even since I published the book uh, and that got published in 2020. <laughs> so again, so much has happened that I couldn't even get into the writing because of deadlines and, and the way the actual publishing process works, unfortunately. So yeah, there's parts of the story that are still developing and I maybe in future articles would be my recommendation to kind of go back and, and analyze that, but otherwise it's kind of closed. Thanks, Simone. That's a really good, um, good thing to, to think about that scholarship is a community-based thing or should be. Um, so, and we get to rely on interesting and uh, wonderful colleagues like you. So um, I, I want to kind of go back and talk a little bit about Summer Avenue now as well. Um, and maybe about migration patterns. You've touched upon this a little bit. Um, but in listening to your talk and hearing you talk about the transformation of Summer Avenue from the 1950s to the present, um, and the migration patterns specifically of Latino people, but also from people from all different kinds of countries. Um, I find kind of similar migration patterns of place like Buford Highway in Atlanta, Georgia, and um, Nolensville Pike in Nashville, and some of in Northwest Arkansas, some of these different um, kind of corridors, international corridors. Um, I was wondering if you could talk to me a little bit about the ways in which Summer Avenue specifically fits into these larger patterns of Latino migration, um, either in the region of the South or nationally. Well, it's so funny you name those particular communities because uh, Tennessee, Arkansas, and Georgia, all three end up making the list in terms of census data of uh, the top 10 states for the fastest growth in the Latino population between 2000 and 2011. So I think those corridors you're seeing is a direct reflection of the demographics uh, of that influx of Latinos that have come, uh, you know, a decade ago or maybe even beforehand uh, and, you know, have become overly mobile uh, through the opportunities at entrepreneurship. You know, or saw something missing in the market, you know, an opportunity to open a business. Uh, and so you do have that clustering. Uh, that's partly because of social networks. So you see residential concentrations, commercial concentrations. Uh, that's what you see on Summer Avenue. Uh, and then they talked back in 2000 even, I'm finding archival pieces uh, that are talking about the Jackson Avenue corridor in particular for Latinos, uh, residentially and commercially. So again, that's going back to 2000. And you know, it's only expanded since then as the influx has, has continued. So it's people coming you know, from all parts, from other states, sometimes directly from Latin America. But yeah, again, the states you mentioned are all ones that have seen tremendous, tremendous growth. So that's why I think you see uh, the landscape changing because with the influx, you see the change in the landscape. That's really great. And I was wondering, um, kind of piggybacking off of this, this idea, um, you talked a lot, and I really loved this term, these newer aspiring Americans, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, these folks who have um, recently immigrated to the United States. Um, and I felt that this implied, you know, action agency on their part rather than passivity or assimilation. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk maybe a little bit about clearly these, these Latinx communities and, and other immigrant communities are also actively reshaping the, the place that they're settling in um, and that are becoming their communities. Um, but at the same time, they're also being impacted by these places. Um, could you talk maybe a little bit about the ways in which your oral history narrators or um, some of your ethnographic subjects, I guess, um, have taken on the role of new or aspiring American, what that kind of looks like? And I love the terminology because it's new to me. Um, part of the research I'm doing is very mixed methods. So there's oral histories. But the other thing I did was I partnered with nonprofit organizations to do quantitative data analysis through surveys uh, and forums uh, and other types of focus groups to meet with larger 
uh, sectors of the community at one time and kind of have people conversate and voice challenges. Uh, and so one of the initiatives is led by Latino Memphis. It's a nonprofit that provides a number of resources, services uh, to primarily Latino immigrants throughout the Mid-South. Uh, one of the largest uh, nonprofit organizations that services the Latino community. And they have this initiative called Gateways for Growth uh, that they're behind. And so I've partnered with them in terms of writing what ended up being kind of the, um, uh, the executive summary and the recommendations for the city in terms of how we can be more welcoming. How can we be a more welcoming Memphis? How can we better incorporate uh, immigrants, not just Latino immigrants, but uh, immigrants, refugees into the city? And so part of the data collection process uh, was trying to better understand the challenges, uh, uh, the contributions as well of these, what they call new and aspiring Americans. So Gateways for Growth introduced me to that language. And part of the reason they say new and aspiring Americans is because there's such a negative connotation around the word immigrant. People hear immigrant and they think of somebody who's trying to take resources uh, that just needs, 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 uh, and not recognizing that certain people are, you know, perhaps on a pathway to citizenship. Okay. Or there's some that don't even have that opportunity, but, you know, aspire for it. So again, they introduced me to that language uh, and they, the people that I worked with there, for instance, some of them had just obtained citizenship uh, and others, I partnered, for instance, also with the Refugee Empowerment Program, uh, where it was individuals that were refugees and other immigrants that you know, were just learning the English language. And they were taking the initiative to do that during the daytime or at the evenings. Uh, and with that in mind, uh, their objective and goal was to take that citizenship test, you know, but they needed the command of the language first. So those are the people we think of as new and aspiring Americans. Uh, you know, that have the hopes of perhaps obtaining citizenship or want the rights. You know, maybe they don't want to give up uh, their citizenship uh, elsewhere. Or again, they're undocumented and don't have the opportunity. But part of that language is to recognize uh, the negative connotation attributed to immigrants. And with that initiative to see, you know, what entrepreneurs especially we found are contributing in incredible ways and revitalizing communities. That's great. Um, well, tell me a little bit. I'm interested too because Summer Avenue is now being branded as this really international space. It's very multicultural, um, full of, you know, lots of people who have immigrated globally. Um, so tell me a little bit about how Latino businesses um, and these other, um, you know, businesses owned by these aspiring Americans or new Americans. Um, tell me a little bit about their relationships to one another. Yeah, and again, in 2019, Summer Avenue caught my attention again because specifically it was the Summer Avenue's Merchants Association uh, run by, uh, well, the president is Megan Medford and she has a roofing company, so she's not even in food ways or anything, uh, but she's done a tremendous job of trying to mobilize the community uh, behind this effort to branded as Memphis's first international district. And with that, there's attempts to beautify the area, uh, draw in more customers. Um, and one of the things they got grant money to do was put up flags, just flags of some of the different countries uh, that are represented along that commercial strip. And they did get some backlash and controversy over the flags. I believe the Vietnamese one was ripped down. And I think the Vietnamese community uh, was actually opposed to the flag being up. Uh, the Chinese flag was questioned. I think there was an Israeli one that was questioned. But again, there was some controversy over this branding. Um, when I interviewed specific people about this initiative, some of them didn't even know about it, which was funny to me. But again, they might not have been part of the Merchants Association. Uh, a lot of people get, you know, they're, they're working tons of hours. They're in, you know, that space all day. So they're working with their ethnic community. But everyone I told about the initiative was ecstatic. I mean, to them, they saw it as a great opportunity for business. So they were behind, again, these are the merchants that I talked to, uh, and they're from Morocco, Yemen, uh, Thailand. Again, there's, there's some diversity there. Um, uh, Colombia, Mexico, but very much behind the initiative. But there were some challenges, like I said. Now, I haven't seen a lot of unity 
per se between say the Latino community and the Muslim community. Not to say it doesn't exist amongst those merchants, but aside from the merchant association, I haven't seen anything that draws all of the international groups together. I know the merchant association tried to do some type of food festival and that was on their list. COVID is probably gonna, you know, take that opportunity away. But I know there was plans to try and bring people together uh, on the basis of international food. But again, I don't know much that brings Latinos together with people from say Morocco and Yemen and other communities. So I think they service maybe a very particular population sometimes that knows they're there. That makes a lot of sense. Um, Katarina has a question for us in the chat and I'll read it here. Um, she says, I apologize for asking you to speak about something tangential to your work, but I can't help but think about the implications of this research for electoral politics and broader cultural shifts in the United States. Can you speak to whether and how ethnographic research such as yours can inform our understanding of the current political landscape? I think the Orlando project was definitely the one that most spoke to electoral politics in that I was working with Puerto Ricans, US citizens. So again, they, it was all attention on that population because it was recognized that they were in a swing state, Florida, along the I-4 corridor, which is considered to be an area that tends to swing as well. Uh, and it wasn't clear always, you know, if they were going to go Democratic or Republican, the Cuban population historically in Miami, you know, more conservative. So, you know, it wasn't clear. So you saw a lot of energy being put towards the Puerto Rican population. Um, but of course, that was during particular moments and times. And then they would feel very much invisible, you know, when it wasn't election season. So there was some controversy over that, certainly. Um, within the specific suburban communities, uh, there were issues with redistricting amongst the Puerto Rican populations, residential concentrated areas. Um, there were questions, even when it came down to campaigning, uh, where sometimes there were campaigns that there was one in particular that depicted the Latino candidate uh, as dark, uh, with dark skin, and the other candidate who was white with light skin. So it got into race relations sometimes. So again, it, it kind of got ugly in Orlando, more, than, more so than I see with Memphis in terms of electoral politics. There's a lot less representation, I think, for Latinos in Memphis in terms of political leaders that are Latino, for instance. Um, I think there's recognition that there's a larger undocumented population. So again, if they can't vote, are politicians willing you know, to really go above and beyond to, to communicate with that population? So in some of the research that was done with Gateways for Growth, and I'm thinking of the statistical data, that was one of the, the things that got brought up, that politicians are not communicating uh, or reaching out to Latino communities at all uh, in Memphis. But I saw something very, very different. Again, it's place specific in Orlando, but I think it's because we're talking about Puerto Ricans, US citizens in a particular state with power and that have shown, at least in local elections, uh, to have power if mobilized. That's really fascinating. Um, I was wondering if, if we're talking about politics, now is probably a good time also to talk a little bit about how the COVID-19 pandemic um, has impacted both the communities that you're working with and your abilities to um, reach out and conduct field work in those communities. I mean, it's definitely very challenging for doing field work because I like to do participant observation. I like to be for instance, at the Refugee Empowerment Program's English language classes. I was the teaching assistant there. Not actually teaching the classes, but sitting there observing everything. Uh, and when COVID happened, you know, all that had to stop. So my ability to actually be in the field, uh, you know, that really just came to an end. But then at the same time, just two days ago, I was recording a podcast with some of the most important people in terms of servicing uh, and documenting the Latino community. And, you know, we did our social distancing and we had on our masks and um, still we were able to have that dialogue and I got great, you know, historic information because they've been here uh, in the community for decades. So in some respects, I'm still able to do research. Uh, in some ways it's even easier be because people are home so I can Zoom interview them and, and get creative with the technology to get access to people. Um, I think the concern is those businesses though. 
Are they going to make it through? Are they going to survive? Because even when I think of some of the oral histories I did in 2017, not all of those businesses are still around. And that's even before COVID. You know, it was a challenge to make it, especially for those that didn't have Mexican food, you know, that had Venezuelan. And I'm thinking of Kaiman. You know, I loved that place. <laughs> Fantastic Venezuelan food. Uh, but again, they just couldn't keep in business. So I imagine with things being what they are, you know, whether or not they're going to make it is, is going to be what time will tell, but again, I think that's the biggest challenge, maintaining that customer base. For sure. Um, we have another question from Jody. Can you, um, here, I'll read it for you. My question is about naming in terms like Latinx and critiques about its accessibility to academics and some activist groups, but maybe not so much to group identities on the ground. Can you talk about how you think about naming as part of field work and naming group identities to, div uh, to different audiences, especially when working across diverse communities? Oh, it's such a challenge. <laughs> such a challenge. You know, when I started writing and doing my research, I used the word Hispanic all the time. And I got criticized for using it because I wasn't using Latino. And I used Hispanic primarily because in Orlando, when I was doing my research, that is what my interviewees, that is what the people on the ground preferred. And I know there's been a recent marketing study that showed the same thing. People prefer Hispanic. Uh, Pew Research Center, I remember, did a study. Again, people preferred Hispanic. So Hispanic was actually the terminology that I saw consistently on the ground that people preferred. But activists, academics, at the time I was doing research, again, this is 2010 to 2013, Latinx wasn't even on the scene yet. Uh, you know, I was getting pushed to use Latino more and more. And I think I eventually caved a little bit. I mean, my book is called Latino Orlando, not Hispanic Orlando. So again, I think I caved just for the academics and the grassroots folk. And in some ways, I go back and forth because I feel like I'm being untrue to the people who identify as Hispanic, that's what they want. And I like to use the terms uh, that the people identify with. Latinx, I find to be very contemporary, uh, something with the newest generation, uh, very much embracing that term. I have a really hard time using it just because when I interview people, I mean, they don't even know what it means. So, and these are people who are being identified as Latinx, uh, but they don't know what Latinx even means. They know Hispanic, they know Latino. I mean, even when I think of the paperwork I had to do, it was Hispanic that got written in, uh, in Memphis with my narrators. So I struggle to use Latinx. I don't use it in my academic scholarship. I stick with Latino or Hispanic, partly because I like to be consistent with the US Census Bureau's categories, because I go over a lot of that data. So it's trying to say things like non-Latino, Hispanic, um, you know, to differentiate and things like that. Um, uh, excuse me, non-Latino non white, <laughs> non-Latino Hispanic makes no sense. Non-Latino white I'll use or non-Latino black to differentiate between people. Again, Latinos can be of any race. So that's where it becomes confusing where people need to identify. Are we talking about someone who identifies as Afro-Latino or as white Latino? Again, just talking census data and, and what I can look at there. But again, I think sometimes it's also personal too because I identify as um, Puerto Rican and Haitian American. Uh, but then I've been corrected and told, no, you're New Yorkian. So again, identities get very confusing when people are trying to label you something versus what you see and perceive as yourself. So for me, I feel comfortable with Hispanic or Latina. Um, Latinx, I don't know if it's going to stay. I'm not sure if it's going to stay around just because I don't feel like people are embracing it on the ground. Certainly people that are just recently migrating. I find it to be a, amongst a particular generation, mostly. So we'll see how influential they are though, you know? Can't sell them short either. Any follow-up question with that? Again, it's so complex, the, the labels. Again, I still prefer to use Latino, but I think I privilege the people I work with. I think that's great. Um, I wanted to shift and talk a little bit about food waste specifically. Um, and the culture of food in Memphis. Um, could you talk a little bit about, um, I guess, how have you seen food ways impact disparate immigrant cultures who share the same space um, with the dominant kind of, like you said, biracial white black binary um, of Memphis? Um, and how, how has that food ways landscape of Summer Avenue either impacted Memphis? How has it changed Memphis? What does that look like? 
you know, Summer Avenue is such an eclectic space as it is. I mean, you can go there and a lot of the highlights when I look at the archives and more contemporary articles, um, a lot of the attention is food waste in terms of Memphis. And I think that's because food is something that's seen as very safe when it comes to exploring other cultures. And I think that's the impact it's having on Memphis, where these restaurant owners, uh, these people who are merchants in, in stores and in groceries that sell ethnic food, they are culture brokers. Um, and there was this really important linguistic landscape study that was done um, on Summer Avenue and a few other areas too. But what they showed was that people would actually, they were taken on these walking tours through these spaces and asked, you know, about the, the Spanish language signage or the Arabic language signage. And they were asked, you know, would you go into these places? Would you go to a mechanic, you know, a Spanish speaking, uh, with Spanish speaking signage? Not to say they don't speak English inside, but just the signage. And consistently people said no, you know, they didn't feel comfortable unless it was food. If it was a restaurant, they were comfortable. If it was a market, they were curious. So I think, again, these people are cultural brokers. Uh, they have shown the globalization of Memphis on this particular commercial strip. They've shown how international Memphis has become. I mean, the Latino population went from, oh my goodness, under 5,000 to you know, over 40,000 in a few decades. So again, it's, it's visible in the landscape. You can't drive through parts of Memphis without realizing there is a Latino presence here. I'm perhaps in a Latino ethnic enclave. Uh, and these individuals have moved in after white flight, uh, you know, and have contributed to the revitalization by bringing in businesses. Uh, and these are families who are moving in and the schools have just increased in diversity. So again, I think it's, it shows you the globalization and internationalization of Memphis in these spaces and places. And again, with food being that entry uh, for, for other Memphians into a more international space. I can't hear you. <laughs> you did. We, um, we have a question from Jeffrey. Um, he asks, um, he, he says it's very interesting to hear about how um, COVID-19 has impacted the business community in Memphis that you work with. And he asks, what has been the impact of government loan assistance for small businesses um, that have been made available by the federal government on this community? I don't know, honestly. My concern would be that the people I spoke with in terms of oral history interviews, um, certainly informal interviews with some of the restaurant owners, um, I see them as not being able to take advantage, partly because not all of them are completely bilingual. So I can imagine just the information might not have reached them. Uh, it would have taken maybe a nonprofit or something like the Summer Avenue's Merchants Association to do extra outreach uh, to make people avail, uh, to make people aware even of, of what loans. So I don't know in terms of individuals, you know, did you apply, were you successful? But just thinking about linguistic barriers that I saw, and again, these are owners, but again, you know, going through any kind of bureaucratic process, you know, is, it's a challenge, what kind of paperwork you have to go through in the process. Uh, so I don't know how much outreach there actually was to the community, but my fear is that there wasn't enough uh, to account for the, also the linguistic variation. It's not just Spanish, you know what I mean? There's Arabic speakers, uh, you have a lot of African refugees that have moved to the area as well. So again, just getting that information to a number of international groups would be a challenge, I think. For sure. Um, people I've interviewed have been, it's been a very, it's been a um, big hardship to, to try to get that PPP loan. Um, so I think that the last question I have for you is what's, what's the future of this work? How do you want to see this project kind of bloom as you, as you move into the future? Well, it's a book project, so the outcome should be the second book, which will be called International Memphis. Um, and so right now I'm thinking in terms of chapters and still doing some of the data collection, uh, but also really trying to write the narrative now. So I'm kind of analyzing what I've gotten thus far, writing and doing fieldwork simultaneously. So it's, it's a crazy process. Uh, but for one, in, one example, I have a chapter dedicated to the Vietnamese completely. Uh, to try and understand what was that controversy over the flag. And if I dig deeper, for instance, uh, and go back to the Vietnam War and to which refugees actually came here, you know, they were from South Vietnam. 
And what that flag represents to them uh, are those oppressors from North Vietnam. So again, I'm trying to tell those stories of that immigrant group, that refugee population uh, that concentrated around Jefferson Avenue, uh, for those that are familiar with Memphis, uh, and some have argued is kind of a little ethnic uh, hub for that population. So again, I'm thinking in terms of chapters, you know, the Latino population, uh, the different spaces and places I've done work to try and talk about, say, the restaurant industry uh, and the challenges for individuals there. So the end goal is a book project, but still talking to people. And now that COVID's happened, I have to kind of see the before and after. So waiting through to see, you know, what happened to, to my interviewees, to those, to those owners, to those merchants. Definitely. Well, I wonder if we can maybe open this up and see if anybody else have, um, has any pressing questions um, or any interests, any things they wanna ask Dr. Delarme about her work. Or, um, Simone, is there anything that we have, haven't talked about that you wanna mention? I think we've covered a lot. I think we've covered a lot. Um, I definitely hope people will look out for the Latino in Memphis, a living history podcast where again, those, those important folks and I kind of talked about and tried to document uh, Memphis history in a little bit more detail. So I'll definitely have to share that with the center when it comes out. Uh, but otherwise, just keep an eye out for more work on Memphis. There's Thank lots you. to do. And I'm, I hope students will be encouraged also to take some of these things up as projects, some of these questions. Thank you, Simone. Thank you, Anne Marie. Thank you to our viewers who asked great questions. Um, I just wanted to pop on and I just I, I put some information in the chat just a moment ago about our next South Talk um, next Wednesday, October 7th, where we welcome graduate of the Southern Studies program with an MA, Amanda Malloy, and she will be in conversation with Adrian Dominic. Um, who is a visual artist in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, I put a couple of links if you are not familiar with Adrienne's work. Um, she is also a co-founder of um, the AND Gallery in Jackson. So you can click on that link and also visit her website. Um, I appreciate your time and energy, both of you. And everyone. I just saw two questions in chat pop up. Should I just get back to them later? Or? No, you can do it and I will pop off. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I just saw them now. I'm like, oh no, I didn't mean to not answer those questions. I just saw them. But uh, let's see. I don't know if you can see them also, Anne Marie. I can. Liliana asked, what made you work, start this work? And Tanya asked, um, has your work explored anti Blackness in uh, Hispanic communities in the oral histories you've done? Or um, what have you heard about that in your work? The debt, the census data is very interesting in terms of anti-blacklist. There's, I think there's a rejection and that goes down, I mean, within the Latino community, I think uh, there's a rejection of blackness that might come from, uh, you know, those home countries you're migrating from. Uh, Puerto Rico, certainly, in the politics of the island, you have that. So I see it in terms of what people identify as on the census. Uh, I see by and large in Memphis, Latinos identify as other, um, not white, not as white, not as black in terms of race, but other, where they're again rejecting blackness. Uh, Puerto Ricans in Orlando, they identify as white in the census, again, rejection of blackness. Uh, there's been studies that show up north, people of Latino uh, descent, Puerto Ricans, uh, Dominicans in particular are more willing, again, it might be the northern context, to uh, identify in the census as black or African-American, uh, again, showing an Afro-Latino identity. But I definitely found more of a rejection of blackness, uh, negative perceptions of the African-American community also in terms of criminality in Memphis. So I didn't necessarily see as much coming together and unification uh, as minorities, but more of a fear almost of the African-American community. Uh, and a fear, I think maybe seeing the racial binary of being associated uh, with that or as black as opposed to as white. So definitely anti-blackness. Uh, and then the reason I got interested in this is because my family. Uh, my family's Puerto Rican and Haitian. Uh, I'm a family of migrants, basically. I was born and raised in New York City, but I was just interested in documenting the migrant experience because I grew up around it and then moved to Delaware uh, where I was in a black, white racial binary in that setting, but still could see ethnic enclaves in places like New York 
and I moved between New York and Delaware. So my personal interests really got me into anthropology and migration and documenting communities. And I think those are all the questions now. Did I miss any? No, I think you got it. Okay, perfect, perfect, perfect. Thank you so much, Simone, for telling us all about the work that you've been doing lately. Thank you so much. And thank you for all those that attended. I really appreciate you taking the time.